Thank you for the introduction. I'm very happy to be here and I appreciate the opportunity to address the IUVA audience on such an important topic. My presentation today is on mercury regulation. What is it? What's driving it? And what is the present and future impact on our industries? I'm the business development manager for GEW. GEW manufactures medium pressure mercury vapor, excimer, and LED curing systems. We do not participate in the IUVA marketplace. Our products are not used for sterilization, disinfection, and purification. We fall under the rad tech umbrella. Our products are used for curing inks, coatings, and adhesives in a wide range of industrial applications. IUVA and RedTech use similar UV technology for very different processes. Together, we both have a common interest in that we should be good global stewards of the environment. We're also both trying to navigate the regulatory landscape when it comes to mercury. Mercury is broadly classified as elemental, inorganic compounds, organic compounds, and amalgams. Elemental or metallic mercury is the form most of us are familiar with. It's listed on the periodic table. Um, it's what is used in many of the lighting technologies um, that we use in our processes. Inorganic compounds occur when elemental mercury reacts with a wide range of substances with the exception of carbon. Examples are mercuric sulfide or cinnabar ore, and mercury chloride or calomel. Cinnabar ore is the most easily acceptable and most um, commonly found version of mercury in, in the environment. It is the version that's mined, uh, referred to as primary mining, and the elemental mercury is extracted from the ore um, for the different mercury added products and processes. Organic compounds occur when elemental mercury reacts with carbon and other carbon containing compounds. Examples are methyl mercury contained in the tissue of seafood, as well as thimerosal, which is a vaccine preservative that contains ethyl mercury. Amalgams are not compounds. Amalgams are mixtures that occur when mercury dissolves into other metals. Examples are archerite, which is a combination of silver and mercury, and dental amalgam, which consists of, of various metals of which mercury is typically um, as much as 50%. Mercury has an incredible list of very useful properties. It's why it's used in mercury added products. It's why it's used in, in various manufacturing processes. It's highly reactive, very dense. It's liquid at room pressure and, and temperature. It cannot be chemically broken down. It cannot be destroyed. It's a poor conductor of heat, but it's an incredibly great conductor of electricity. And when we vaporize mercury into a plasma gas, it emits ultraviolet energy. Examples of mercury uh, use in products are uh, the typical fever thermometer. Uh, the first thermometer that used mercury was introduced in 1612. Uh, it was perfected over the next 250 years and really didn't become practically used um, on a wide scale until 1867. Uh, the first electronic thermometer was introduced in 1954. And over the last you know, 15, 20 years, there's been a steady migration uh, to digital thermometers, which eliminate the use of mercury completely. Lighting technologies follow a similar development in the sense that the first prototypes of mercury vapor gas discharge lamps uh, were introduced into the 1890s. Uh, General Electric commercialized uh, low pressure fluorescent mercury lamps in the 30s. Uh, germicidal lamps were introduced in the 40s. And then medium to high pressure mercury vapor lamps um, started to become more available in the 50s and the 60s. Um, LED technology, which does not utilize mercury, uh, was introduced for general lighting around the 2000 and has been slowly and steadily progressing for the last 20 years to the point now where, where many of us um, are using LEDs in lieu of um, mercury vapor gas you know, fluorescent lamps in, in home and business lighting. The mercury cycle refers to how mercury travels throughout the biosphere. Because mercury is highly reactive and changes form so easily, it travels um, very easily around the world. It is emitted naturally when volcanoes erupt, which emit mercury from deep within the earth into the air. Uh, whenever a forest fire occurs, mercury in the vegetation is released into the air and into the surrounding water bodies. Um, when factories burn, um, 
or when, when power plants burn coal, um, mercury is released into the environment. When cement is produced or factories uh, employ other processes, mercury is released in the air, um, waste products enter our landfills, um, mercury makes its way into lakes, rivers, and streams where it migrates through currents uh, throughout our oceans. Whenever mercury interacts with microorganisms at the bottom of our oceans, our lakes, and our streams, single cell microorganisms uh, convert inorganic mercury through a metabolic process into methylmercury. Methylmercury works its way up through the food chain through biomagnification. In other words, a little bit of amount, a little amount of, of methylmercury in the organisms become increasingly greater concentrations as the larger species that are that live a much longer life and consume much greater amounts of food over their lifetime store that methylmercury in, in their tissue. Anthropogenic refers to uh, anytime mercury is directly or indirectly emitted to air or released to water by human activity. Uh, the UN tabulates uh, global mercury inventory about every five years. This data is from 2015. Uh, the 2020, 2021 data is not available yet. But 10% of the emissions to atmosphere come from natural environmental occurrences. Uh, this would happen um, regardless of, of human activity. It comes from soil um, and rock erosion, uh, volcanoes, forest fires. 30% uh, is from anthropogenic man-caused activity. And the remaining 60% is legacy re-emissions. Uh, we've been introducing mercury into the environment since the 16th century. It was heavily used in silver and gold mining um, and then throughout uh, industrial manufacturing processes. Today, um, at least based on the 2015 data, 60% of the annual anthropogenic activity that contributes to mercury pollution um, comes from coal and artisanal small-scale gold mines. Uh, these are released to the air. 38% of the releases to water are also from artisanal small-scale gold mines. The World Health Organization um, attributes the greatest risk of mercury exposure to humans as coming from dental amalgam, artisanal small-scale gold mining, and seafood consumption. Dental amalgams consist of a, a variety of metals, but typically they're at least 50% mercury. Um, when the dentist is placing the filling in the tooth, there's a chance that some mercury will off-gas uh, during the filling process. There's also a chance that some of it will off-gas when it's being removed. But typically when the filling is set in the tooth, um, it's, it's generally regarded as safe, although um, you can certainly find uh, differing opinions on, on that perspective. Artisanal small-scale gold mining uh, is a process where that occurs in 70 countries globally, uh, typically in poorer countries. The miner will procure a bit of elemental mercury and travel to the mine where they will put um, dirt, rocks, soil surrounding the mine in a small bowl, as you see on the screen, they will crush it up and add elemental mercury. The mercury reacts with the gold to form an amalgam. The miner will wash away uh, the, the dirt and the particles that are, do not form the amalgam. And then they take a blowtorch and they heat the amalgam to vaporize the elemental mercury into the air surrounding the miner. Some of this is inhaled and some of it goes up into the environment. Um, all of the waste that is washed away then contaminates the soil and exposes and contaminates um, the surrounding um, water supply. The final risk of, or primary risk of, of mercury exposure to humans is through seafood consumption. Uh, we discussed the mercury cycle on, on the previous slide. Um, there's a billion uh, people worldwide that, that get primary source of protein comes from seafood consumption. And if you tend to eat the larger species such as tuna, there's a greater propensity for the methylmercury to build up in, in your system. Mercury added products refer to any product where mercury in any form is intentionally added during the manufacturing process. That mercury remains part of the final product for the sole purpose of performing a necessary function. Examples are dental amalgam, button cell batteries, uh, mercury vapor lamps, thermometers, fluorescent tube lamps, compact fluorescents. All of these products contain some amount of, of mercury. 
since uh, 1980, when it started to become more clear to us that mercury was toxic, um, the EPA cites that in the U.S., 97% of our mercury added products have been eliminated. We've, we've found alternatives uh, for those products. Uh, the remaining 3% are a lot more challenging uh, to find alternatives to. The images on the bottom center, we have PVC pipe, we have sodium hydroxide, otherwise known as lye or caustic soda, and chlorine. Chemical processes uh, use particularly those that contain chlorine-based chemicals, use chloroalkali electrolysis um, processes to produce those chemicals. This can be done through diaphragm cell, membrane cell, or mercury cell. In the US and the EU, um, much of our chemical manufacturing has moved away from mercury cell processes, but it's still heavily used in the rest of the world, particularly in China. Vinyl chloride monomer production, which is the primary ingredient in PVC, is one of the um, largest demands for, for mercury for manufacturing. And most of that is taking place uh, in China. And unfortunately, as the U EU and the US you know, convert our manufacturing of chemicals away from mercury, unfortunately, there's still a large portion of chemical production that has moved to China. So we can pride ourselves in the fact that we're no longer using mercury, but in a lot of cases, what we've done is we've just offshored uh, that mercury use to China. The levels of mercury content varies widely from products. Um, the top left of this table shows some examples of lighting products. Um, spiral compact fluorescence, compact fluorescence, and fluorescent tubes contain the least anywhere from 0.8 milligrams to about five milligrams. Uh, five milligrams is about the amount of mercury that will just cover the tip of a ballpoint pen. Uh, germicidal lamps contain between five and 15 milligrams. Medium pressure UV is anywhere between 10 and 100 milligrams. Uh, the U UN uses an, an average of 25 milligrams uh, for medium pressure UV lamps when they take their inventory counts. Um, by comparison, Thermometers, a typical oral thermometer that many of us have, have used um, at home or in a doctor's office contain as much as 610 milligrams of mercury and more sensitive basal thermometers that you might find in the hospital or in science labs contain as much as 2.25 grams of mercury. Dental amalgam contains between 500 and 1,000 milligrams of mercury and average is about 800. Uh, gold you know, mining for gold um, takes anywhere from 1.3 grams to 20 grams for every gram of gold produced. 20% of the world's supply of gold comes from artisanal small-scale gold mines. This includes jewelry, uh, this includes manufacturing processes that require gold, and it also includes our financial institutions. Products that contain significantly more mercury, such as electrical relays and switches, and medical devices have since been discontinued. As soon as it was clear that mercury was toxic, um, most, um, most industries immediately started moving away and, and finding alternatives. There are five primary sources of elemental mercury. Primary mining, uh, which is a case where we, we mine cinnabar and then we distill that cinnabar to extract the elemental mercury. That occurs in four countries. It used to occur in a lot more, but currently today it's only happening in Mexico, Indonesia, China, and the Kirk Republic. Byproducts of non-ferrous mining operations and oil and gas refining um, produce mercury. This is primarily where um, European nations and, and the US get most of our elemental mercury supplies. We also recover mercury anytime we decommission a chloroalkali facility or treat waste products. Uh, we also recycle spent mercury. So all of the mercury products that, that we use should be recycled. They should not be disposed in general trash collection. There are also reserves held by governments and private entities. Today, 60% of the global demand for mercury is driven by gold mines in Africa, Asia, and Latin America and vinyl chloride monomer producers in China. The Minamata Convention, which we will talk about here shortly, um, permits active cinnabar mines to operate until 2032. In 2008, the EU and the US um, decided to ban the export of elemental mercury. At the time, 
uh, the EU and the US were the primary uh, suppliers of elemental mercury on the global market. The bans were enacted in 2008 and then went into effect in 2011 for the EU and 2013 for the US. The US focused exclusively on metallic mercury, whereas the EU included um, three additional compounds um, that were easy to extract a mercury from. In other words, if, we, if the EU exported a compound to a country where the country's whole intention was to extract that mercury, um, the ban was meant to prevent that from happening. The EU also included mixtures where mercury was more than 95% by weight. In order to align with Minamana, the EU and the US added a few more compounds um, in 2018 and 2020, respectively. Humans are very creative and there's always unintended consequences. And that is the case with the export bans. What happened in the EU and the US is that the, these regions were limited um, to domestic sources of mercury for all of our mercury added products and processes. Uh, these regions could no longer sell mercury and the listed compounds in the international market, which meant that domestic supplies in these regions increased and the domestic prices fell. What also happened is that the cost of recycling increased. Um, previously, recyclers were able to subsidize the cost of recycling mercury by selling it onto the international market. After the bans, that was no longer possible. In the rest of the world, the global supply of mercury shrank. The demand increased due to chemical manufacturing in China and gold mining in other parts of the world. And so the prices surged. As a result, we ended up with three distinct economic markets. Closed mines reopened. Um, this happened particularly in Mexico. In, in the 90s, there were no functioning cinnabar mines in Mexico. They had all been closed. There were 300 known cinnabar mines at the time, and none of them were in operation. As soon as the export bans were passed, these mines started opening up because manufacturers who previously could not uh, economically justify mining cinnabar now had a, a, a new market which they could serve. Primary mining only occurs in Mexico, China, Indonesia, and Kyrgyzstan um, currently, and that can continue, as I mentioned, until 2032. The bans incentivized unsafe production and illegal distrib distribution. Many people in Indonesia were, were building um, distilleries in their backyard and on their porch. They were procuring cinnabar and unsafely distilling elemental mercury at home, which they were then shipping in shoddy packaging with um, incorrectly filled out shipping paperwork. So the result was that the net global inventories of mercury increased over the last 10 years, despite the EU and the US taking ourselves out of the market. Mercury is a neurotoxin. Um, it affects motor skills and sensory abilities. It affects um, the brain and the nervous system. It can lead to organ failure and, and even um, loss of life. There are various factors that affect the toxicity of, toxicity of mercury, um, the form, the dose, the rate of exposure, the method of exposure, and the age or development stage of the person or the fetus. Um, mercury can be inhaled, it can be ingested, it can be injected, and it can be absorbed through the skin. When bound within the earth, permanently and properly disposed or securely stored in products and storage containers above ground, mercury is generally safe from direct human exposure and environmental harm. So when used correctly, um, all of these neurotoxin issues uh, can be avoided. Because mercury migrates so easily and changes form so easily, regulation needs to be on a global scale. So the Minamata Convention is an international treaty it was introduced in, a 2000, introduced in 2013. There were 128 signatories at the time. As of 2021, there have been 131 countries that have ratified it. It's completely focused on, on mercury and it's hosted by the UN environment. The international treaties, however, do not have an ability to legislate within nations or enforce policy within nations. It's basically the overarching vision or global goal between the parties that have signed on to the treaty. It's up to each and every one of those 131 nations to then go home and pass legislation in their home country that 
it makes them compliant with the international treaty and uh, spells out exactly what is going to happen within that country and how it's going to be enforced. In the European Union, uh, which is again one of the ratifying countries, the European Commission issues directives uh, that the member nations then have to legislate on a national level. The, the regulations are binding um, and they always specify the date in which they enter force. The directives that are most commonly dealing with mercury are REACH as well as, as Rojas. In the US, Congress has given the EPA full authority to regulate toxic substances, including mercury. Uh, this was updated in 2016 with the Lautenberg Act, and effectively all the EPA has to do is publish a rule in the Federal Register, and that rule becomes binding, binding law. The Minamata Convention on Mercury has 35 articles. I am not going to go through all of these um, articles here today, but I encourage you to download the treaty and, and read it. You can, you can read through it in about an hour or two. But the Minamata Convention on Mercury states that each party shall not allow the manufacture, import, or export of mercury added products. This is the um, policy that most companies and individuals refer to when they mention that mercury is, is a banned substance. As of today, mercury is, is not banned. The Minamata Convention is a global vision. It's, it's what we aspire to. But until legislation is passed in each and every one of those 131 countries, um, the Minamata is, is, is simply a guiding force on, on the nations that have signed onto the treaty. Minamata also allows for five-year exemptions. Um, they're available if parties write a letter to the Secretariat explaining why a particular mercury added process or product should be exempt. The Annex A of the Minamata Convention lists several various exemptions. Uh, one exemption is where no feasible mercury free alternative for replacement is available. As a result, many of the processes that we use today and products that we use today that contain mercury are exempt if it is not clear, both technically, economically, and practically, that there is a viable uh, alternative. Article 17, 18, and 21 primarily focus on information exchange and reporting. We are still very much on a fact-finding mission. Countries are trying to understand how mercury is entering each and every country, how mercury is being used in those countries, and how it's being disposed of. This is an ongoing uh, process. Um, Minamata requires company, uh, countries to be compliant in this information recording and exchange. And right now is where most countries are primarily focused. REACH focuses on substances of very high concern. Um, these substances are meant to be phased out and replaced with safer alternatives. REACH does not currently have any restrictions on mercury UV lamps, and there are no phase out dates um, for mercury UV lamps. There are some products that are restricted from being uh, placed on the market. You can see them um, in the box there. The one that's most relevant to us is uh, fever thermometers. Um, those can no longer be placed on the market in Europe. Um, they can be sold in the US. However, it's become increasingly difficult to find um, mercury thermometers. Pretty much everything has gone digital because it's become um, economically viable and a, a suitable replacement. Rojas has gotten a lot of attention uh, this year um, because we're in a renewal year. Rojas regulates hazardous substances in electrical and electronic equipment, as well as the waste stream of electrical and electronic equipment. There's 10 substances that Rojas uh, restricts. Mercury is one of them. In the Annex 3 of Rojas, there's a list of exemptions for A, for E, and for F. These apply to the products that IUVA and RADTEC use. Um, for A applies to low pressure discharge lamps, so germicidal lamps. For E refers to metal halide, typically your medium and high pressure lamps. And then for F refers to all discharge lamps for special purposes not specifically mentioned. There are currently no Rojas limits on mercury use for 4E and 4F, and no phase out timelines for 4A, 4E, and 4F. Excluded from scope in Rojas is all large scale stationary industrial tools and large scale fixed installations. In the curing industry, we apply this to all manufacturing lines that 
take a considerable amount of effort to put into place. They run on high power, take skilled labor to, um, to operate them. These have all been understood to be exempt. I would imagine for IUVA, this would include um, municipal water treatment facilities. So even if um, mercury products were to be banned, if the scope exemption is not eliminated, it would still mean that many of these large scale fixed installations um, are, are continue to be exempt. A big portion of Rojas focuses on uh, recycling. Uh, we wanna make sure that mercury added products uh, when they're disposed, that they're not uh, entering the, the waste stream and entering the groundwater and, and being emitted to air. So for all of us and our customers, we should be recycling all of our mercury added products, including the lamps that we use. In the US, um, the Lautenberg Act is the overriding congressional policy at the moment. Uh, the EPA can publish rules uh, changing regulations on mercury. What they're focused on right now is, is implementing a reporting system. Uh, the US is going to report every th three years an update of how we are importing and using mercury and mercury added products and processes. Mercury can be disposed of um, in a couple different ways. Um, first, you know, there's always improper waste disposal. Uh, mercury added products should not be thrown into general trash collection. Um, they really need to be separated and, and recycled. This keeps mercury out of the biosphere and keeps us um, accountable to sustainability efforts. When there's no longer a use for a portion of mercury that's, um, that's being stored, it can be permanently disposed. What we do is we take elemental mercury and react it with, with sulfide to form mercuric sulfide, which is also cinnabar. The cinnabar can then be reacted with a special cement and placed in designated salt mines or special landfills. Essentially, we're basically turning mercury back into cinnabar and placing it deep within the earth so that it's far removed from human, human and animal contact. So what is the impact on, on our industries, on IUVA and RadTech, on lighting technologies? Well, first of all, Minamata Convention on Mercury is the overarching global vision. It is, it is a policy that 131 nations have agreed to. It is what we all aspire to and is goal is to eliminate all use of mercury. International treaties, however, have no in-country legislative or enforcement authority. As a result, it's up to those 131 countries to legislate their own laws and enforcement regarding mercury. Uh, currently, Rojas in the EU is the most strict legally bonding regulatory policy. It only applies to EU member nations and companies selling into the EU. Uh, the EU Commission meets every five years to review exemptions. This was supposed to happen last year um, because of COVID. It's now happening in July of this year. VDMA, which is a uh, machinery organization in Europe, as well as Lighting Europe, which covers a broad range of lighting technologies, both submitted exemption request applications. They did this in 2015 and they did it again in, in 2020. So um, many of us were asked to provide public comments. Those were due May 27th. There is um, a couple organizations that are reviewing everything and then we'll submit final documents for this EU meeting in July. Um, it's not likely that much will change. However, you know, regulatory policy is very, very difficult to predict. Um, I wrote a, a paper that we will be releasing uh, following this meeting, but we're, we're holding back just to kind of see if there's any new additional information that needs to be included. Um, both IEVA and RadTech um, were submitting letters um, on, behalf, on behalf of both applications. Um, I believe RadTech has already submitted theirs and I think IUVA was still making a, a few changes. In the US, uh, we're currently focused on implementing our, our reporting system, but there are no bans or restrictions on um, the use of mercury in, in lighting technologies in the US. So this is evolving regulations. It's a dynamic situation that's gonna continue for the next five, 10, 15 or more years. So at the end of the day, innovation and economics ultimately drive change. Until alternatives are technically, economically, and practically viable, it's very difficult to switch, regardless of the goals of the regulators. 
where regulatory policy is effective is that it creates awareness and applies pressure to expedite change. And in this, you know, the regulatory policy has been successful. If it wasn't for Minamata, if it wasn't the fact that it's a Rojas renewal year, if the EPA wasn't implementing a new reporting um, system, I probably wouldn't have investigated this at the depth that I did um, last year. And I wouldn't have written a paper on the subject. And I certainly wouldn't be here today giving this talk. So in that sense, regulatory policy is definitely making us much more aware and allowing or causing all of us to be much more informed on, on the subject. It's up to us, however, to continue innovating, developing products, collaborating throughout the supply chain, and working with our customers to drive the entire industry and the entire world's population away from mercury added products and processes. But, th but that takes time. And once those alternatives are available, the regulatory policy will step back in and, and hold us accountable. So as I wrap up my slides, I'll, I'll leave you with a few uh, closing thoughts. Um, the first is, is that IUVA has lined up two days of a fantastic list of, of talks on uh, UV technology. As you listen to the speakers present their thoughts on their uh, technological breakthroughs and their use of the, the products and their various applications, keep in mind the mercury regulatory situation. It's important to understand where those products are viable, technically, economically, and, and practically. And if they are an alternative for all the different variations where, where they're currently being used, it's, it's going to take time to push this technology throughout all of the respective applications. And what we can do is we can look to two similar markets and, and what they are experiencing. One is general lighting. Currently today, there are no bans on fluorescent lights. You can buy tube lamps, you can buy compact fluorescents. They're still being manufactured, they're still being sold, they're still being used, hopefully recycled. But LED has made progress, LED for general lighting. It's becoming much more economically attractive. Um, the technology has improved significantly. Uh, it's much more available and consumers are are naturally gravitating towards LED technology. This is happening organically and without any regulatory um, efforts at all, other than the pressure to drive to drive change. Another industry is, is the dental industry. We have a technical alternative for mercury dental amalgam, and that is um, UV curable resins. Many of us, when we go to the dentist, we're not getting a mercury dental filling, we're getting a resin filling. The challenge is, is that mercury fillings are significantly less expensive. They're very easy to administer and they're actually more durable. So when it comes to impoverished communities, um, the most vulnerable populations around the world, dental amalgam is still a better alternative. It's a much more accessible alternative for them. The EU had originally targeted 2020 as the, the year that they had hoped to ban dental amalgam throughout the EU. That has since been pushed back to no later than 2030. The EU is currently reviewing plans and the practicality of eliminating dental amalgam. It's a technically viable alternative to use resins, but it's not always practical and it's not always economical. So every market that uses a mercury added product or, or process is going through this right now. It's trying to understand what the alternatives are and if they can be implemented. The alternatives to medium pressure and low pressure mercury vapor lamps are not just excimer lamps and LED lamps and xenon pulse, which do not contain mercury. Alternatives are also non-UV you know, devices. So chemicals and other processes. And in the case of curing, there are other ways to dry materials that are not necessarily more environmentally friendly. So businesses and humans are very innovative and, and very creative. And in an outright ban on mercury added products and processes doesn't always achieve the environmental goal that the regulators are, are, are hoping to achieve. So because of that, we all have to do what we do best and we have to innovate. We have to continue developing new products. We have to continue working through the supply chain and working with our customers to drive everyone to um, products and applications that no longer rely on, on mercury. 
So with that, um, we still have, I believe, about five or six minutes left. So I appreciate your time and attention. I think this is a very important topic, and it's be, going to become increasingly more important over the next five, 10, uh, 15 years. So um, I encourage you to um, take a look at the Minamata Treaty. There's also several documents put out by the EU the e, and the EPA, um, as well as, as the UN. Um, so with that, we will open the floor uh, to questions. Thank you very much.